Good, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, wonderful to see a nice big turnout, and uh, we're very excited to be here with you all today. Um, now, there are seats up at the front, you know, it's an like undergraduate class. <laughs> Please move up to the front um, if you feel Happy. so inclined. Happy. <laughs> uh, my name is Martin Horak. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm from the Department of Political Science, and I've been involved in the development of the center from the outset. Um, and along with Godwin Arku, who's over there, and who you hear a bit from later on, I'm one of the two associate directors of the center. Um, we actually have a director as well, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, we have an exciting panel lined up for you. Uh, but first, I, I wanted uh, to give our dean, Bob Anderson, a chance to say a few words of welcome. Creating the center wouldn't have been possible without your support. So thank you for your support. Thank you for being here, and, uh, and welcome. Okay, well, thank you. So I just have a few little things to say, and uh, many of you already know this, I'm sure, but for those who don't, uh, Western has a long history of engagement with local government and urban development. Uh, the local government program has trained generations of public servants. Graduates of our urban development program work across the province in planning, real estate, and property development. And our faculty, there, there are many of our faculty members are involved in research in urban areas, especially in geography, political science, sociology, and anthropology. So we're, we're really, this is something we're proud that we're good at. The new Center for Urban Policy and Local Government will take us to another level. So it'll serve as a hub for interdisciplinary collaboration on urban issues. It will also connect academics and practi practitioners in government, business, and nonprofit in the nonprofit sector. So we're hoping this is going to make us even stronger and get our word out. <coughs> the new center also plays an important role in MES. For those of you who don't know, we have a new network on economic and social trends. Basically, it's an institute. It's not an official institute, but that's how it works. We have six centers that, uh, that, that fall underneath its umbrella, and, and the new center is one of them. The directors of those centers, they, uh, they actually run the institute or the, the, the network itself. So this network brings together uh, people from all kinds of uh, different social sciences. So we're going to try to tackle collaboratively some of society's biggest issues. Things like go good government, economic growth, educational attainment, poverty, social inequality, migration, and ethnic relations. So we have centers that come together and we're hoping that we're going to have people going across disciplines to work on these issues. I'm very pleased to welcome NEST, or welcome the new center to NEST, and look forward to its future accomplishments. I, I couldn't end without saying congratulations to, to uh, Zach and to Martin and to Godwin, and uh, you guys have done a great job, and I look forward to seeing what you produce. And I also look forward to seeing some of what's here today. Unfortunately, I have to leave a little early for faculty council, but but I will, I will stay as long as I can, and, and I'm looking forward to it. So, congratulations. Thank you, Bob. Um, my colleague, Zach Taylor, um, He's been a driving force behind the creation of the center from the beginning. Um, and he's also serving as the center's first director. Um, and I, I, would, I would like to give him the chance to tell you a little bit about the purpose of the center and what we already have got underway. So uh, please come on up. Then. Well, thank you, Mark. Thanks, thanks uh, for those remarks, Bob. So as the director of the center, I'm really very pleased to welcome you here today. Um, this moment has been a long time coming. Uh, I'd like to thank Martin and, and Godwin and uh, Merlin Chatwin in the back uh, there has uh, put a lot of work into this over the summer. All of our faculty and graduate associates uh, who put a lot of hard work into making the center reality over, over the last couple of years. Um, so as Bob said, uh, we hope that the center will um, will be a hub for urban research, not, not only within Western, um, but that it'll also be a bridge uh, to practitioners in the outside world. Um, so our roundtable today on the intentional city exemplifies what we hope to achieve, uh, creating opportunities for conversations about dilemmas and solutions in our increasingly urban society, uh, not only close to home in London, but across Ontario, across Canada, and across North America. So economic growth, social inequality, immigrant settlement, housing and homelessness, environmental justice, these and other policy uh, dilemmas are most often found in cities. 
uh, and many of the solutions to those problems will be found in cities uh, as well. So our goal in creating the center is to contribute to these debates by providing evidence and connecting academics to policymakers and advocates. So before we start the roundtable, I just want to talk very briefly uh, about some of our initial projects uh, and events. Um, as many of you know, London was the first city to use a ranked choice voting system in its recent municipal election. And there's a um, city clerk right there that ran. Yeah, yes. <laughs> she deserves a standing ovation. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, you know, other municipalities across Ontario are paying a lot of attention to what happened here about the administration of this, this new electoral system. Um, so early next year, the Centre will host a workshop with city staff to derive lessons from the London experience, um, and we plan to collate that into a public uh, report. Um, a second ongoing project is what we're calling the Canadian Local Government Inventory. So it's been at least a decade, maybe more, since anyone has done a comprehensive audit of local and regional government arrangements in Canada. Um, so we had some students, some who were, who were here today, uh, do a deep dive this summer comparing legislation and institutional structures in all 10 provinces and three territories, and uh, in a representative selection of 22 municipalities. We're working through this material now, and uh, we hope to release a series of profile documents and data sets uh, in the new year. And on another front, uh, we'll soon launch a series of papers that will translate policy-relevant academic research uh, into um, uh, into materials that practitioners can put to work. Um, so the first one of those will be a comparison of municipal economic development plans by geography professor and center associate director Godwin Arku uh, and graduate associates Merlin Chapwin and Evan Lee. And finally, um, we are very pleased to announce that uh, one of Canada's preeminent urban scholars, uh, UBC's David Lay, uh, will give our distinguished lecture in January on January 10th, um, and he will present his research on the social and economic and policy impacts of the influx of foreign capital into Vancouver's housing market over the past three decades, um, and we hope to see many more at that event. So in short, we're very excited about the Center, about the research it will produce, about the connections to practitioners that it will create, and the conversations that it will start. So without further ado, let's start a conversation. Um, we're very pleased to have five people with us today who have a lot to say about the challenges facing mid-sized cities like London and the potential for such cities to strategically shape their futures. So I'll now turn it over to Martin, um, who will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, so uh, London has a reputation as a place that changes slowly, as a place where many people don't like change very much. But London is changing. London is changing in profound ways, economically, demographically, and socially. And we can let these changes happen and take us where they will, or we can start a conversation about being intentional. And this means taking, taking stock of the challenges and the opportunities that we face as a community, as a city. Um, it means thinking about how we'd like the city to evolve, and it means thinking about who we bring together and what structures and institutions we can build together to move in the direction that we want. Um, and those are all things that we're gonna touch on in the next hour or so during our panel discussion. Uh, our five panelists today have a wealth of insight and experience to bring to the conversation, and I'm really pleased that they're all with us here today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd like to just briefly introduce each of them. Um, why don't we go in this direction from, uh, from Pierre, Pierre Filion, over there on my far left, not ideologically, I don't think. Uh, he is, um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> you want to switch places with somebody? <laughs> uh, Pierre. Uh, Pierre, like to to the <laughs> Pierre is a professor at the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo. His areas of research include metropolitan scale planning, downtown areas and suburban centers, and infrastructure. He served on the Planning and Real Estate Advisory Committee for the National Capital Commission. Um, he's also served on the Central Zone Strategy Panel for the Ontario Ministry of Municipal Affairs. In case you're wondering what that is, that is the uh, 
Um, that is the panel that led to the development of the Greater Golden Horseshoe Plan, which many of you have probably heard about. Um, he's also been a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the International Joint Commission, and he's the author of many, many papers um, and some very important work on urban development and planning in the Canadian context and beyond. Um, next to him we have John Fleming. Uh, John is the Managing Director of Planning and the City Planner with the City of London. I'm trying to tweet right now, I'm not answering text. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has a BA in Urban Development from here at Western um, and a Master's in Planning from the University of Toronto. Uh, he's worked as a planner in the private and the public sectors for 26 years. Um, in London, he helped to establish a number of organizations, including the London Economic Development Corporation, Main Street London, Landmarks London. He led the Rethink London process and the development of the London Plan, which is something I think we'll talk about in the next few minutes. Um, and he plays a leading role now in various transformative initiatives, such as the Shift London Rapid Transit uh, Plan and the Dundas Place Flex Street, um, which is phase one of which is just being finished downtown. Um, so welcome, John. Um, next to John, we have Michelle Baldwin. Michelle is executive director of Pillar Nonprofit Network. Um, she helped to co-create innovations work, innovation works, um, and Verge Capital here in London. She has extensive experience in nonprofit management, social <coughs> enterprise, social innovation, social finance, and communications and fundraising. Um, and she currently serves on the board of the Ontario Nonprofit Network and London's Community Economic Advisory Panel, among many other roles. Um, she's also a past board member at Huron University College. Um, <laughs> and uh, Michelle holds a Master of Educational Psychology and a BA in Psychology. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Um, next to Michelle, we have Ariel Kayabaga. Um, Ariel is the Ward 13 City Councilor elect here in London, so that's the downtown and areas near downtown ward. Um, I'm not in my role yet, so. Um, yes, Councilor elect means yeah. that you're, so, yeah. Yeah. you're waiting in the wings yeah. for yeah. December, yeah. right? No yes. <laughs> um, uh, prior to that, Ariel was a mentee to Councilor Virginia Ridley. Um, she has a BA in political science from Carleton University, and she's worked in caucus services at Parliament Hill. Under, pre, uh, under Justin Trudeau. She has served our community through settlement work for newcomers, uh, through activism in the black community, um, and work with the Climate Change Youth Coalition, among other things. And she's also the mom of a nine-year-old. Um, mm, yes. so, so welcome and thanks for being here. Um, and finally beside me here, we have Neil Bradford. Um, Neil is chair of the Department of Political Science and the Governance, Leadership, and Ethics program at Huron University College, right across the street from us. Um, and we only see each other about once every two or three months, which is amazing, but uh, that's the way that things work sometimes. See, this is one reason why we need a center, right? Um, he's, he's written widely about urban, social, and economic development in Canada, uh, with a focus on multi-level governance and policy innovation. He was the former director of the Cities and Communities Program at Canadian Policy Research Networks in Ottawa, and he is currently a partner with the Evergreen Mid-Sized Cities Research Collaborative that brought a great one-day event to London last spring that I was at on mid-sized cities. Right. Um, actually, a number of us in the room were at that event. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, my aim today is that we have an informal conversation. Um, I have a few questions. I will direct those questions sometimes to individual people, but I hope that you all feel free to jump in. Um, we're <coughs> not going to uh, have a Q&A with the panel, but instead, after about 50, 55 minutes, we'll wrap up our conversation and we'll have 15 or 20 minutes in the room where everybody can get to know each other and talk to the panelists mm -hmm. and have a conversation in a really informal way. Um, so, uh, it's, it's hard to know exactly where to start this conversation because there's so much to talk about, but I thought maybe a good place to start the conversation is by thinking a little bit about the big picture social, demographic, and economic trends. And Pierre, I thought maybe I'll start with you on this one. Um, how do you think the urban system is changing in Ontario? What does the research tell us about how the urban system is changing in Ontario, and where does London fit in okay, with what, that? What it shows is that it's not easy to be in the middle. 
Hmm. Okay, so we're not in a period of time, and, and I place at the extreme left here, as, hmm. as, as, you, as you mentioned, but you know, <laughs> that, 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 was, that was documented politically as well. What, when you don't have, and when you start having uh, measures to control capitalism or the market economy, it starts polarizing. And this has been the case, you know, over the last decades. And it's happening from a social point of view. I mean, David Hochensky has documented mm -hmm. the urban impacts of that yeah. very clearly. You know, the areas that were <coughs> middle class in the city of Toronto and around as well are disappearing and are being replaced by areas that are poor or areas that are richer. The same thing is happening at the scale of the urban system as well. The large metropolitan regions are attracting a lot of people, are attracting growth, and what is located in between, <coughs> unless they're related to resource areas, are not doing very well. So, with, so within that picture, London <coughs> is the ultimate middle. You know, that, that there's a lot of conversations, a lot of debate about what is a middle-sized city, and very often, you know, when, the, when there are panels and discussions of middle-sized cities, that becomes the main object <coughs> of discussion. You know, does that qualify as a middle-sized city or not? <laughs> there's a wide gray zone about that. I mean, does Markham qualify as a mid-sized city? Does Brampton qualify as a mid-sized city? I don't know, but they're obviously within the Toronto metropolitan region, and they're part of that region. But when you look at London, it is clear. It is a discrete metropolitan region. It is not within the immediate orbit of other metropolitan regions. It has exactly the right size for the mid-sized city, 400 and something thousand. It is not going very rapidly, so it will remain the mid-sized city. And also, very importantly as well, is that it's playing the, from a central place theory perspective, that those who have done geography, like Chris Saller and all that, it is definitely playing the role of Central Pole within southwestern Ontario, within this part of Ontario. <coughs> so it is in the middle of this region and it plays that role within that region. So that makes it difficult for a place like London. I mean, it, there are a lot of opportunities, but some of the problem that it's facing has to do with that polarization of society. Okay, yeah. I want to open this up to other people as well. Yeah, John. I just want to very briefly say that um, what Pierre just said kind of aligns with one of the theories that I have is London is almost the Winnipeg of Ontario. Mm -hmm. So we're off to the west, we're somewhat isolated, and uh, we're kind of a, a city in a cornfield. And uh, that presents some really interesting opportunities and also challenges. And so how we deal with those things, how we attract talent, I'm always talking about how do we build a city to attract talent and the investment that goes with talent is, I think, really important when you're the city in the cornfield as opposed to uh, being in the GTA or some of these other growth centers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, um, anybody else want to come in on this? Do you see what long-term kind of trends do you see that are going to be affecting the way that London can develop in the future? I think um, when we talk about he just said something that really stuck out to me because I guess I had a different idea to it. Um, mm. London is going to be a mid-sized city for a long time. It's not going rapidly. Um, mm. I thought I had a different view on that because oh, yeah. I felt like I was seeing um, a higher population of people coming to London and as we're planning on building our city um, to have great transportation. It already has great tourism. Uh, we have a great um, health care system here in London and social programs. Um, a lot of people know that and it's mm. the hub where people are coming for, the, for those kind of things and um, as we're trying to build, you know, <coughs> transportation if we ever get there, um, <laughs> I have to add that, if we ever get there and have um, good infrastructure and tra um, transit system that works and we can, you know, kind of retain um, skilled and, and professionals and, and our students and I think that it's, it's going to continue to, as Toronto is getting big and it's getting expensive and it's getting pushing a lot of people into poverty, mm. they're going to start shifting into our city. So I wonder if that's going to be a slow move or it's going to be a fast move, it's going to mm. hit us strong. As you can see, our rents yeah. are starting to go high um, because of, you know, people who have money to buy uh, more expensive, you know, buying housing and it's leaving locals a little bit out of that market. So I'm wondering if it's going to 
grow fast or it's going to go as slow as mm. he's saying? I don't well, know. That's, that's an interesting question. That. Yeah. Yeah. I think I want to get back to that in just a few minutes, the kind of GTA effect, mm. yeah. <laughs> because we are starting to see a little see bit of that. Yeah. Um, but before we go there, I, I guess an, I, another way of phrasing a similar question is, and maybe Neil, you, if you have any thoughts on this, is there anything that you think that is a unique strength for London, despite the kind of challenging macro context that Pierre was just talking about? Yeah. I, mean, I, th I think that given the framing that you set there, Pierre, very accurately, that there is a kind of intellectual and analytical challenge here of developing an alternative model to growth and innovation that sort of plays off the Richard Florida creative city, you know, mm -hmm. high tech niche sector strategy. And that really doesn't fit in some ways to the challenges that the mid-sized cities face. And I think there we've got to look more internally. We have to look at more <coughs> collaborative forms of uh, intersectoral work. We have to look at uh, you know, a wider range of potential growth areas that combine advanced manufacturing with some niche high technology agribusiness, that there's a range of kinds of economic strategies that we need to really think about. And they involve the kind of creative work that Michelle's been doing around social enterprise and social finance, that, you know, a, a different entry point into globalization is one of the big challenges for the mid-sized cities. Mm. And to really push back in some ways on that kind of the imposition of the kind of sort of Richard Florida creative cities, you know, global city model of what we aspire to and what our asset base can credibly lead us to build and deliver. And I think London's been very actually innovative in exploring these alternatives over the past decade or so, in part enabled by a council that's created an interesting framework around co community inclusion and diversity, the London plan, the uh, medical research cluster, mm. uh, and that's kind of intersected with some really <coughs> creative work at the level of civil society and the business community. <coughs> so we have right. many examples of kind of pragmatic, collaborative efforts around immigrant settlement, the kinds of big challenges Zach spoke about, that I think, if we stand back, they aggregate up <coughs> an alternative model to the creative city. Well, it, it, can, let me just pursue that for a minute. What is that kind of, is there a hallmark to that model? Is it about uh, metaphorically not putting your eggs all in one basket and about connecting across different ways yes. of developing? Because yes. I kind of hear you talking yes. about that. I'd like others to come in. I call it inclusive innovation, yes. which is kind of a jargony mm -hmm. mouthful. Yeah. And Michelle is completely positioned to speak, you know, the Okay, Michelle, let's, let's hear yeah. from you. Well, yeah. Inclusive innovation. Um, well, I think you kind of hit on it. It's this, you know, um, many cities that have grown really quickly have this, you know, kind of uh, disparate group of people who have lots, people who have not ha had a lot. And so how do we make sure we're growing a city that's thinking about an economy for all? And so obviously I bring the lens, just throwing it into the room around social enterprise, and I think it's one of the tools that can, you know, be used. There's lots of other ones. It's one of um, how do you have different kind of industries and opportunities, not... Um, and so it's an entry point, I think, <coughs> for what I think we need as a city is um, to be thinking about what are the impacts that we're having as individuals in our organization, in our businesses, and how mm. do we reflect on that from that um, that per perspective. And so everything from the equity inclusion lens to the environmental <coughs> impacts. Uh, and so my big dream is that nonprofit business and government are thinking about that holistically through that cross-sector uh, right. collaboration and that when you think about innovation it's not innovation for growth and scaling it's about making sure you're creating an economy for all right yeah um, you know I mean this this isn't on my list of questions but it, it makes me think um, are we in a city like London do we are we best placed to think about the future of London in terms of growth or are we do we get too worried about growth slow growth mm -hmm. not enough growth um, is a model of development that's appropriate to London one that is more about diversity and inclusion than about rapid growth because as Pierre was saying the rapid growth is not happening here mm -hmm. I don't know this is just a, that's a very good there. question mm -hmm. um, I think that we do have a lot of issues in London right now that we must work together to solve and mm. as we think about growing the you know the numbers of people who are in London um, and we're not able to solve those issues first then we're gonna it's again it's gonna fall into those big cities that grow too fast and then leave some people out I think mm. um, the work that Michelle 
Is there something? There, this is squeaking. Oh, we're squeaking. Yeah. <laughs> so here, let's maybe we can move back. Okay. Okay. We should have oiled the furniture. Yeah, I know. That's all right. We got it now. Okay. That's okay. We're and the, what Michelle was saying, how we have to look at um, in inclusive innovation and just making sure that we're <coughs> we're looking at every aspect of, of the community that we have right now before we grow into go into the, the numbers of how many people are in London and focus on really providing good services in our city and making sure that everybody. I, I saw one of the questions was who gets to decide how our city grows, right? And mm -hmm. I just thought, I think the community has to collectively come together and make that decision and, and make sure that we're reaching out to the people that we're not able to reach right now. I mean, there's 300,000 people, um, you know, more in, in our city right now. Are we able to reach each and every one of them? Are we able to respond to the, to the, to the problems that we have in our community right now? And if we can, can solve that, if we can nail that to, you know, to the ground, then we can, <laughs> I think I'm gonna stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can, you know, start thinking about it w the numbers will grow as our city gets greater, as we, we have great programs and people feel included and people feel like this is a city that they can call their own, right? So Right, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I want to pick up on where Ariel just left off, and that's about the quality of the city. Yeah. I'm going back to my mm. city in a cornfield again, but uh, I actually brought this whole story because I thought it might be <laughs> useful. <laughs> so it's about 25 minutes from now. Uh, <laughs> so 1991, United Airlines was looking for a site to locate a new $500 million maintenance facility. Can you imagine that? Uh, talking about 7,000 to 7,500 new jobs. 1991, the salaries were averaging around $45,000. So there are four cities on the short list. Sounds a lot like Amazon, right? Uh, <laughs> Oklahoma City, Louis, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Denver, Colorado, and Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. So uh, Oklahoma City's proposal was to construct the facility. So they were gonna actually build it for them. No cost to United, financed with a one cent sale tax, sales tax, and supported by bonds. Um, and then, through the negotiations, uh, the site selector said to the folks at uh, Oklahoma City, you guys have the best package by far, your incentives are awesome, we're coming there. Um, so Mayor Norick, uh, who was the mayor at the time of Oklahoma City, he was so certain they would win the bid that they called a press conference on the day of the announcement <laughs> and had the press assembled in his office. <laughs> so you might not want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> to hear the presentation from United. Imagine his surprise and embarrassment when it was announced that the facility would go to Indianapolis. And oh. So the mayor followed up with United to find out what happened, what the hell happened. Uh, he was told that before the final selection, United flew their management team who would head up the new facility to <laughs> all the bidding cities. So they went to all four of them. And they told the president that they would not take their families to Oklahoma City. And Mayor Norick was told that Oklahoma City did not have the quality of life expected of their employees. Uh -huh. And so after that, uh, Oklahoma uh, developed a program with the Chamber of Commerce there called MAPS, Metropolitan Area Projects, and they spent uh, five billion dollars, uh, well sorry, five billion dollars of impact, but millions and millions of dollars on things like a ballpark, uh, a downtown park, uh, Civic Center Music Hall, Cox Convention Center, Energy Arena, it's culture, arts, entertainment, quality of life stuff. So, you know, when you think about exactly what's been said over here, uh, the quality of the city that you build. These are not just fluff projects. These are not just spending money for fun. These are things that really can attract talent, attract investment, create jobs. When you create jobs in a municipality, that helps everybody across all the ground. So I think we forget that. We think about economic development often in terms of chasing smokestacks, uh, getting out there and doing some of those traditional things, giving incentives, 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 free land, those sorts of things. But we often forget about what we have to do to attract people to our community. All right. Well, and, and Neil, you wrote about well, this in the past, right? There's yeah, different no, ways yeah, to no, economic no, exactly development. Right. I just wanted to, um, I, I wanted to not leave the impression that diversity and inclusion and growth are kind of, we trade off those. Right. But, you know, there right, are yeah, ways yeah. in the mid-sized cities that we can, we can bring this together. And London recently has been a really interesting example. You know, on the diversity side, we have a very dynamic local immigration partnership council that has in fact partnered with Western, the Pro uh, Pathways to Prosperity Project, and done some really neat programming. 
around settlement and integration on the diversity front that links directly into economic development. We have an employer community that's come together in a very innovative way in a program, Michelle, you'd be aware of Ability First, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a very, it's a, it's a Canadian first, actually, the way in which the employer community in London has come together to create space and opportunity for people facing various kinds of mm. challenges in, in employment. So, and, and all of that leads to a more dynamic, creative, diverse workforce. Uh, and in turn around inclusion, if you look at what the local economic development corporation, if you go on their website now, they really have a portfolio of sectors they're targeting, right? And yes, they're doing digital media, as Richard For Florida would like. But, you know, they're also doing advanced manufacturing. They're doing agri-food in a very creative way that speaks to the cluster in the Old East Village and sort of the, the, the organic mm. food movement. They're doing social enterprise now in a way that they did not 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. They are linking up with the Employer Sector Council and Workforce Development Board on labor market training that links to these four uh, target sectors. And all of this is a, a broader way of trying to link, you know, um, inclusion, diversity, and growth in a, in a sort of coherent model and strategy. Mm. Um, and as I say, the, the last council deserves credit for, for, for embracing this wider framework around diversity, inclusion, and cluster building, you know. Okay. And you do, so I don't want to go too yeah. much into detail on this, but there are alternatives to kind of the Florida global city funky you know, <coughs> cafe strategy that applies really to San Francisco and Toronto, I, you know, maybe. Mm. And, it's a, and it's a tougher road here in London, but we don't have to go that route, and we're not. Well, um, I mean, I hear you saying that we can, that we have an opportunity, maybe an imperative in London, to bridge the divides among different ways of doing economic development and building the city, right? So right. The, the traditional smokestack chasing and... Uh, uh, the creative capital. The creative capital, and then there's the social inclusion piece. So we got three different pieces. Um, and I also hear you saying it's not a zero-sum game, but I do wonder whether, at least politically, you know, there aren't tensions there sometimes. And sometimes there's real challenges. I mean, I think about, and I'm moving here a little bit to, to planning. Uh, a few years ago, uh, John helped to run the uh, Rethink London process, produced a London plan, uh, which, in terms of the way the city grows physically, is very innovative. It's more about growing in and up, and not out. We know from an academic and from a long-term perspective that there are big advantages to growing that way, but there's a lot of resistance, right? Um, there's a lot of pieces of the system that, um, that resist a push in that direction. You know, developers, not all developers have been very excited about the plan because <laughs> there's new restrictions, uh, there's new costs, right? They, uh, They've, they've, they've felt like their voices haven't perhaps been heard as much as at least they used to be heard, and that could be a problem for implementation. Um, you know, also we've seen people who like density in theory, but don't necessarily like density in practice. Where I'm going with this is I would like, you, I'd like to hear from John, but anybody else as well who wants to come in on this, on the challenges of, you know, when the rubber hits the road in terms of long-term ambitions and plans that really depart from the way we've been. How do you bridge that? How do you make that transition? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'd say that, did you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that you're right, Martin, that uh, there's been a lot of pushback. But I also think that there's been huge advancement on the London plan already. And, and it's actually startling when you start to look at how much things have moved forward. So the last council, it was in the newspaper the other day, the last council approved, I think it was like 2,000 units or something crazy, but um, mm -hmm. that's growing inward and upward. And although some of those were maybe not exactly aligned with uh, the plan, they're pretty close, even the ones that are off of the, mm -hmm. the bullseye. But a lot of those units were in the bullseye. They were center ice for where we're looking for infill intensification. So growing inward and upward does all these great things like help to regenerate urban neighborhoods and reduce the need to use a car to get around energy conservation, air quality improvements, um, supporting transit, whether it's rapid or not. But you're right, I mean, there's a lot of resistance because some people, some developers or landholders own land in locations that have nothing to do with where we're trying to promote that growth. What we've been trying to do is use things like rapid transit to create incentives for uh, growth and development in that inward and upward configuration. <coughs> laying out the planning permissions, being very flexible with those permissions. You can go up, you can mix your uses, 
in those areas where strategically that kind of density would, density would be most beneficial. So you could characterize that stuff as kind of carrots, and we've stayed away from, to, for the most part, a really regulatory heavy approach to try and say you can't grow out at all, you've got to grow this way. So there's a little bit of a, a push and pull, and I think that staying away from the heavy regulatory approach is one of those bridges that you're talking about to try and help it to happen without, uh, help make it happen without um, getting stuck in, in our trenches and, and not making any progress. Things are harder in terms of intensification in size cities. When you look at Toronto, the two major factors of intensifications is the cost of housing and congestion. Okay. When you're in a place like London, because of housing is not that high compared to Toronto, and there's no congestion. Well, there is. It's all relative. <laughs> it's all relative, but you know, let's put things into perspective. You know, there's relatively little congestion, so it, so it is possible to go to different destinations by car fairly easily. So the impetus for recentralization intensification is less here, and as a result, you see that the market for intensified development in a place like Toronto is, is much larger than it is in a place like Waterloo Region and even more so in a place like London. In a place like Toronto, you've got young adults, people who can't afford you know, to live in, in uh, lower density types of developments and some retirement. In places like here, in places like where I'm from, it's largely retirement. Retirement is a much bigger proportion of people. Not that there's anything wrong with that, you know, that's, this is perfectly <laughs> fine, but it makes for a smaller market than in other places. Mm. Well, I think that it does bring us back a little bit to what Ariel mentioned a few minutes ago about the relationship between London and the greater Toronto area, right? The last couple or three years, we've began, begun to see some real estate market effects here and some development effects from spillover from Toronto. Um, you know, prices have gone up, there's been interest from developers, more from the GTA. Um, is this the start of a bigger trend? Is London close enough to become part of that kind of orbit of the GTA the way that uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, I think, arguably has? And, um, and if so, what does that mean for our thinking about the possibilities and the challenges for London's future? You want me to start? Oh, wow, that's a big one. Um, I think um, one of our unique value propositions when I hear about why people come is because we have that distance. Um, so mm -hmm. one of our new board members, if you haven't met him, Melvin Wright, he actually looked at a map and he intentionally chose London because he was from Toronto early on and he wanted to be close enough but at the same time in a distinct community. So while I want to see um, high speed rail and all, like I, I think we want that connection, I think it's about the unique value that we have as a as a community and um, and so for me uh, you know it's a, and um, having both being connected but also having that kind of um, that kind of independence and I love the language of a dis discrete and there's challenges with that I get it but there's something about like that place making and local piece that happens in our neighborhoods mm. with our you know all the nonprofit <coughs> government business coming together that puts us in a unique position and I guess just to weave it all together, it's like, who are we as human beings in our city and what's that sense of belonging and what is London's story that, you know, we can all say we're a part of? Because I feel like everybody's trying to make unique stories and I think that's the part that it's, <coughs> and all these stories is what makes up London. I mean, isn't that interesting because it's, you know, every, I moved to London 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I got to tell you quite honestly that I'm not sure that I've quite figured out what London's story is yet. <laughs> mm. um, <laughs> it, it seems to be, it seems to be complex. And it's really not a place that's defined by one thing, mm. right? And, um, and yeah, what I hear you saying is that <coughs> being distinct is perhaps part of what is attractive to us as a community, that we're not, we're far enough away from the GTA that we're kind of not in that orbit. I mean, the question is, if, if we keep attracting people for being distinct, is that going to change? And how is that going to change? Right. Uh, Neil, do you have well, any I, I, oh, Well, go ahead, Bert, well I, I, very quickly, I would say, I mean, with, with respect to the GTA, we do have the, uh, I mean, we have, as Michelle says, the kind of advantage of quali quality of life kind of uh, you know, appeal. 
<laughs> and also, in, in the new knowledge economy, I mean, technology really does enable kind of virtual working relationships. So, you know, you can be a young person working in London on digital content or something and be connected into mm -hmm. a technology cluster in Waterloo that's doing a different mm -hmm. piece of the knowledge economy and into Toronto, right? So, there are potential opportunities here where geography doesn't matter as much, high-speed rail or not. The <laughs> other point I would make, though, about the, 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 the Toronto, the GTA relationship, if you think about what was presented in the Community Foundation's Vital Signs report over the past two months, we, you know, David Hall Chansky might well want to come and look at London as a mid-sized city experiencing this kind of polarization mm. around poverty, the precarious workforce, uh, issues of substance abu abuse and addiction. These are really big city, you know, yeah. social issues. And, you know, one of the big challenges, I think, collectively for all of us in this room right now is those challenges, of course, reach beyond the scope of the municipal government. Yeah. And we have a provincial government now that's not particularly interested in an urban social agenda. Um, and we're, we're really kind of looking for, for external partners to kind of, you know, leverage some of these entrenched social problems. Mm. And I have some ideas about what might be available. That's mostly federal around okay. infrastructure programming and so forth. But we as a community have to be prepared and ready with, with a variety mm -hmm. of tools to leverage those dollars that will increasingly, I think, come more from the federal than the provincial government. Mm -hmm. It's a larger yeah. discussion, but we look, I'm just saying, Professor Holchansky would do well to reach out beyond Vancouver and Montreal and do some mid-sized city polarization, yeah. spatial and social studies, and London would be, would be Interesting. I want to get back to that in a sec, but I know John had something to say. Well, John. by the way, I always love these discussions because as a panelist, you always learn way more than you're, you're actually uh, sending out there, and that's happening today. Uh, I, I think that one of the reasons, Martin, maybe you don't, you can't really read London Story is because the bottom fell out of London Story. London Story was all about being a regional center. If you wanted to do business in this region, you had to do it in London. And so if you're a candidate, finance, insurance, real estate, old money, you know, we had long established old conservative money. And then all of a sudden, kaboom, everything changed. And a, a lot of that was probably relating to uh, communications technologies changing and the ability to be able to still do business in a back office, smaller sort of way in London and have the headquarters elsewhere. Um, I'm sure there are lots of different reasons, but all of a sudden London found itself having to reinvent how it was going to succeed. And I think we've been writing that story over the last 20 to 30 years, because really that's not the, the bottom fell out probably in around the 80s. And London, I used to do the growth forecast when I started at the city in 91. And uh, I, I remember so distinctly that we look at the provincial lines, we looked at all the trends, and we were always above the growth forecast for the province. <clears throat> and that changed in around the, the 80s, mid to late 80s, and it's it's never recovered. We've always had a lower growth rate uh, than the rest of the province. But how do, how do we succeed? And I think that the conversation over here around the grass, grassroots approach, um, building up, we've got, we're really well positioned, I think, from an agriculture perspective. We forget that sometimes. I mean, that cornfield analogy <laughs> is useful. It's positive. It's something that, uh, can really benefit us economically. And we've been talking about urban agriculture as one way to even get it in, you know, that whole notion of agriculture into our community and community economic development. So I, I think the point again is just rewriting the way that we succeed is something that we're still we're working our way through. Mm, yeah, yeah, Pierre. I, I, I think there are two dimensions that need to be balanced here. Uh, one dimension is the growth dimension and the relationship to the GTA, GTA chain. Uh, put the fast train, and within a few years, you're like Waterloo Region. Okay, your house prices are going to go up. All of a sudden, you're going to get that growth. You're going to feel, you know, the effect, you know, of the Toronto Region, and you're going to become within the orbit of the Toronto Region. Uh, there's about 100 kilometers between us, and, you know, a fast train would make it so that, you know, that friction of distance would more or less disappear as a result of that. But there's another dimension as well, is that cities have a culture and have a different levels of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to quantify, it's very difficult to measure, but I know, for instance, in, in my region that Guelph has much more of that than Waterloo Region does. Okay. 
when I go to Guelph, you know, I know there are, you know, a lot of hippies in Guelph and all that. <laughs> There's that way of thinking that is there, and it is part of the identity of Guelph. Waterloo Region has an identity, uh, and actually maybe, ha many, maybe has too many identities. <laughs> London has an identity. London, you, you, you were talking, John, about the, related, the uh, similarity with Winnipeg. I mean, Winnipeg is one city that has major personality. I mean, certainly, I mean, it has a ballet, has theater, has a lot of culture. For people my generation, they guess who came from there, and all, and all that, you know. It, it, it really is an entity. Nick really young as well. But he's fantastic. The other people, their the places you claim it. But anyway, but it's the same thing with London. I can't name names as easily, don't worry. No. No. Oh, that's an interesting question, though. So what, it, you know, does, does London have an identity? Does it have a culture? You know, what people often say, well, London is, as I mentioned at the beginning, London is conservative, London is averse to change. And I think maybe that's connected partly to the legacy still of what you were just talking about, John, right? That London was an old money place, a self-sufficient regional center. And that's begun to change. And, and so, and naturally there's some resistance to that change. So, uh, so what do we do with that, right? When we think about going forward, um, is uh, how, how, how do we create a different sense of collective identity in London rather than Southwestern Ontario's old regional center? Um, or whatever it might be, and you know, what 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 do we build on uh, that binds us together? Mm. Um, and Michelle. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm taking this in a different direction, but I sure. just read okay. this amazing book. Kelsey Ramsden, um, Canada's top number one entrepreneur, wrote a book recently called Success Hangover. And she talks about how are you always adding new ingredients to your life? Um, and so she just gives this simple, like, drive a different way to work or walk a different way to work. And we're creatures of habit. And so I think our story is changing, but we're holding on to something else. And change is really hard. So if you look at, I'll put into the room, the whole <coughs> transit discussion, it yeah. became so polarized. And I even found myself, I admit, going down, like not understanding the other perspective and getting entrenched in my own thinking and really having to push myself out that if you're going to create change, you have to look at w why, why are people holding on to that perspective mm -hmm. uh, and try to find that, that um, common place to have that conversation because when you get so polarized. So I think for me, I think the strength of London is if we can recognize there is a new story that's told and we keep going back to the conservative because that's what we knew. Um, right. But if you, like, I, I'm in my bubble of innovation works and if you hang mm. out there enough yeah. or if you're at the Pillar <laughs> Community Innovation Awards, which really all we're doing is providing a platform, the stuff going on in this community is magical. And if we can mm. really just um, hold on to that and then be open to a bigger conversation, I think, and try to understand other people's perspectives even when they're really difficult because uh, you just feel so like, I know that this is um, the right thing. I think that's how we're going to make change. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. from a, yeah. a millennial perspective, um, I find it interesting when I hear what other people think of London. And I, mm. uh, we had some visitors this week that were touring London, and I, they kept asking, what is it about London? What's the culture of London? What's London's mm. identity? And I thought, you know what? London is what you make it to be, right? If you want it to be conservative, it's going to be conservative. If you don't want it to be conservative, it's not going to, like you just mm. said, if you hang out in an innovation spot like you're you're not going to see any of the the challenges that London still has to go through it, it's about creating I think London has room for everyone to create what you know a city is for them mm. right if you want it to be you know like an urban agriculture city for you you're going to build that you're going to have a community that's going to support you to do that if you want to if you want it to champion some something specifically like I feel like it has for me, I campaigned in the core, and I felt like London has a strong heritage culture. Mm -hmm. Heritage is, is and it, it's also yeah. changing into the way that it can fit into the modern, modern you know, life. And but I also felt like London can be what I want it to be, right? If I wanted to, there's a lot of things that I don't know that are happening in London because I'm in this mm -hmm. sector and in, in this field. And I don't know, like it's for me, it's not that conservative anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's shifting and it's it's changing and there's room for that to keep changing and the less we speak on it the less reflect on it the more it's going to go away in my opinion mm -hmm. interesting yeah. okay thank you oh, yeah i'm going to jump off of not as conservative anymore and try to link it back to inclusive innovation 
I would I suggest that London, again as a mid-sized city, is really on the leading edge of some major institutions in cities across Canada. Our medical officer of health is absolutely extraordinary. The way he has brought the social determinants model to the whole question of, of, of disease and, and, and addiction and so forth. Um, Libro Credit Union yeah. mm -hmm. is an absolute powerhouse of social investment. $7.7 .7 billion of capital that is targeted to sort of the social good and, and financial outcomes. Um, your Pillar Nonprofit Network has essentially reinvented the voluntary sector in this city mm -hmm. as a model that is, that is appreciated, you know, North America wide, I can tell you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. uh, I would put my fourth institution here is the challenge is still out there, and that's the, the post-secondary education sector. Fanshawe's done more than Western, and Western has to up its game, and I include yeah. that in my own institution here on U University College. We have to engage with the, the wider community in the city. The fourth story, I want to tell a bit of an anecdote here, and th this tells you about moving away from conservatism. I came here in London in the late 1990s, and one of the first things I was confronted with was a mayor boycotting the Pride Parade, mm -hmm. and in fact violating the Ontario Human Rights Code to make this statement. And it was just all very bizarre to me coming from, I was actually coming from Ottawa, so it was bizarre. But here, that was 1999-2000. Here we are, if you think about it, 2018, uh, the prom queen high school project of the Grand Theatre, when the school board pulled the funding, a civic entrepreneur by the name of David Bilson mm -hmm. actually did a crowdsourcing funding call uh, he met, they, they met the target to fund the play in the first 24 hours and they raised $60,000 out of a crowdsourced initiative here to ensure that this play, which is you know, expressing the diversity of our millennial generation, would be able to be launched at the, at the, uh, at the, at the, uh, yeah. at the Grand Theatre. So I think back to boycotting pride, violating human rights uh, legislation to that prom queen experience and that these are stories about London that really capture the kind of shifts that we're speaking about here at the level of culture, in addition to those institutional leaders that we have here that we don't talk yeah. enough about. Yeah. Yeah. And we may um, not completely be there, but we're going to get there because we're pushing for it, right? So, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I, I know I'm supposed to be asking questions, not commenting, but I, I can't resist <laughs> making one comment. Um, from my perspective, one of the reasons why the transit debate, the rapid transit debate became so polarized, and there's a number of reasons, is that there is a, an element of London's identity and self-image that came into that debate. Um, that it became, to some extent, a debate about what kind of city we are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also saw, just anecdotally talking to people, that there was a big generation divide mm -hmm. there as well. Mm -hmm. right? and, and so maybe London's finding a new identity is tied to a sort of generational transition. Um, so I'm, I'm just putting that out there. We can pick on the, uh, up on that or not, as, as we will. Uh, yeah. Um, I didn't realize there was a, a debate on rapid transit. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you, John? If there was, I, I think that change is hard. Change is, change is hard, as Michelle, I think, pointed out. And I think there is a little bit of a track record. This is maybe a little controversial to say, but uh, it's Friday. And <laughs> it, I think it's kind of as a track record of doing something like getting to the precipice and going to take a big leap into a new kind of stratosphere. Mm -hmm. And this comes with reinventing yourself. Yeah. And uh, then kind of says, no, that, mm -hmm. that looks, <coughs> the water looks cold or whatever. And I felt a little bit of that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are some projects that embody that, like uh, what's, our, what's our performing <coughs> arts center? Um, mm -hmm. Centennial Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is it was <coughs> going to be a different design and pretty um, amazing and then at the last minute I got pulled back and it's, I just wonder if it's that change that um, you were talking about Martin that uh, it's something that happens sort of a couple steps forward and then one back a couple steps forward one back which can be very frustrating when you're in a position like mine but when you look at longer term getting to where you're going um, it, you get there Another piece of it is you could do big, massive change, or you can do it incrementally. And some of the stuff that mm. Neil's been yeah. pointing out and Michelle is doing—that's that's really you know getting into that's creating change and actually quite rapidly, but at a smaller scale, which is easier for people to maybe swallow. 
right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, w one thing that we haven't talked really about yet is, um, you know, we can, we can have, we are having a conversation about the longer term future of London here, but I think politically sometimes that conversation at the city level can be difficult to sustain. Now, I think our, our last council actually, and at least one person who was on our last council, and is again, hi Jesse. Uh, uh, I, I think a lot of folks on our last council have been much more focused than previous councils on thinking about and, and acting in terms of long, London's longer term future. But the incentives are often there, not just politically, but in the community, to really focus on what's important now, on the short term, on crisis management. And, and so my question is, outside of this room, how do we sustain a vigorous conversation, a public conversation about where London is going long term, and, and who leads that kind of conversation? Or, does it, and, or who needs to come together in order to make that happen? Um, yeah. A really quick answer. This won't surprise Zach when I mention this. I'm a big fan of the Toronto Civic Action Alliance, uh, which is a kind of non, uh, a non-governmental, multi-sectoral group that actually has a kind of institutional structure, and it and it, it looks to long-term issues across the GTA, uh, brings together multiple sectors, and then they link it to discrete project work on big issues around the environment and homelessness and so forth and transit um, and they, they you know they work at arm's length from the municipal government they draw down federal and provincial resources um, you know our urban league may be a potential mm -hmm. vehicle where to scale up and try to think about a more formal civic action mm -hmm. alliance for the mid-sized city Michelle I mean not the pillar may be a vehicle for that you know but but work to, together or what's that more together? But it sounds like the key is beyond government, not it's, just yeah. government. It's beyond yeah. government, but it, and it's a very dynamic but permanent yeah. mechanism for the kind of longer term horizon analysis you're speaking about that is linked to action. Mm. Yeah. I, I might. Uh, okay. Um, so I, we, we've been talking about how to get beyond the kumbaya of collaboration. It's really, really <laughs> difficult. And I think um, similar to the work everybody's hopefully focusing on around equity inclusion, you have to give something up. Um, and I, so if I use the London Plan as an example, that was a huge community consultation. The community showed up in a huge way. We have this plan, but it, it's hard to sustain things through political systems that are shifting and evolving. Yeah. Uh, and so, how do we um, how do we carry a thread of something as amazing as a London plan? Or there's a million other examples, even with that changing um, political system. And I think it's about everybody giving up some <laughs> sort of power. Uh, and not thinking that it, there, it has to be their next big thing or, you know, like what are we doing together rather than what, I'm, what am I doing and where's the spotlight for me? And I think that's, yeah. the, that's the shift we're going to need in order for us to see like those big projects, mm. um, projects happen and, uh, and just carry through. Because having to put everything in incremental change is fine, but um, Kate Graham often says London needs to believe it, can, it deserves big things. Uh, and when you're traveling, you seek cities that believe that they deserve it. And, and uh, I think that's where we're getting to. And let's carry those threads, the big things, through the bold mm -hmm. moments. Yeah, John? Uh, I just want to jump on that because I believe that as well, that sometimes <coughs> we suffer from a lack of self-confidence as a community that we can do this. So when you look at the rapid transit situation in Waterloo, they did it and they paid for it themselves and they did it before, well, they didn't end up paying for, the, for themselves, but they were doing it and raising taxes doing it. And uh, they, before they even had provincial approval, they got going. So it, it's just a bit of a contrast there. Um, and we're not the only ones. Hamilton, for example, they're getting a billion dollars or 1.3 billion. And, uh, you know, they're also, they, they've had a lot of conversation of, around whether they're going to go forward on it. But I think that's a really an important point. And I think that everything comes down to people. You know, there's sort of systems, there's governments, all those things, but it's the people that are either in those systems or in the community that actually make a difference. And one example I'll give is cycling. Cycling has been something that's been important for London for a long time, and we've not been able to really gain traction forever. And uh, we did a, <laughs> oh, <laughs> true, a cycling master plan, so to speak. I think it was about 15 years ago, it came out of planning, and not much happened after it. But then somebody by the name of uh, Ben, ben. Uh, <laughs> Cowie started just hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, getting, 
community together, push, 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 and response and action. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, when you look at a lot of the people that are, you know, whether it's a counselor that is pushing a, a specific thing or a member of the community, somebody like Michelle that's like able to move mountains, that's what really, I think, changes things. And so, you know, sometimes people don't look at themselves as champions. They, I think the more that we can give people that feeling that they can do this and they can make a difference, the more champions we'll get and the more we'll move forward. Um, uh, Pierre, um, having listened to the conversation for a while now, um, and since you were, uh, you're in uh, KW and yep. uh, um, have a lot of context there, do you think that there are lessons or insights or ways that uh, KW has charted a strategic course forward that, uh, um, that London can learn from, or is it just a very different context? I, I, I must confess that I wasn't aware of the rapid transit debate in London. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Really? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll start reading the free press. No, no, no. I won't do that. Actually, that's, that's really an important point because, you know, I've got confessions to make. You know, I, I, I know London a bit because I work here in 1972 for six months, but <laughs> importantly, is, and, and it was really inter interesting in 72 because downtown London was really alive. You went downtown London yeah. on a Saturday afternoon and the sidewalks were full of people. Like people came from all the region because there were four major department stores in downtown London then. And it was really the central place, a gravity place, you know, for the old surrounding area. Another point as well about that time, John Sewell had written an article about transit in London. And he said at that time that transit was much higher in London than in other cities the same size across Canada because it had such a centralized structure. That was lost, you know, completely. We could go into the details about that, but you know, that, that, that's not my job here. Let's go back to KW now. Okay, <laughs> so K, KW, how, how we got transit? Okay, rapid, rapid transit or uh, light, light rail transit in KW. It was a coalition. It was a coalition of interests that came together. There were the environmentalists who were fighting for it and their strong constituency. There were the rural councillors. The decision was taken at the, at the level of the region. So there were rural councillors on the regional council who didn't want to have urban sprawls within the area. And they thought that by having a light rail, it would create intensification in the center. There were the creative <laughs> class types. And the creative class type says, well, you know, we need something to attract, you know, those creative people and they don't drive, so we need to provide them <laughs> with light rail transit. And last point, very important one, is the economic development constituency. Right. That was very, yeah. it, you know, I, I, I've given a number of tours of Waterloo Region, you know, four or five, you know, over, over the last few years of people who come from outside the province, and I always have, you know, in the tour, a planner from the region or someone from the transportation department from the region to talk about the LRT. Never, and I hope there's no one from all the region here, but you know, the, <laughs> I'll tell you that secret. Never did they mention improvement of the public transit system. Okay, when they were talking about the LRT. All they were talking about, we've got all those billion dollars redevelopment that is taking place within, within the access. When they gave a tour, they come with a map with all the developments you know, that are going to happen. That was a major argument. So, so it's when all those people were brought together that the decision was made to go ahead with the light rail transit. Mm, very interesting. Yeah. Um, just a couple of more questions maybe, and then uh, um, I think it, Godwin just told me, no, maybe we should take a couple of questions from the audience. So, so I think we will. I think we'll bring people in. But before I do, just maybe two more things here. One is I want to get just a little bit back to the issue of entrenched poverty in London, which is tied to what John started us out with, uh, um, or excuse me, not John, Pierre, uh, started us out with like 45 minutes ago when he was talking about, you know, the eco bigger economic context, right? There's, there's deep structural reasons why in London we only have a 60% labor force participation rate was one of the lowest in Canada 
of you know in an urban center. Um, we have 25 percent of kids live in poverty. You know these are these are deep deep structural issues, right? And and as as Neil was saying, a lot of the levers of control are not local. So uh, um, so I would I would love to hear folks' wisdom on you know what it is. What, what are the biggest points of leverage locally <coughs> for beginning to deal with those issues? Understanding that we can never deal with them entirely at a local level. But where can, where can community leaders, where can governing mechanisms come in most effectively at the local level to support those who need that support? <laughs> yeah. I guess, oh, were you? No. no okay. um, I just start by talking about housing and you know I learn a lot of this from my colleagues and essentially when you're looking at poverty the number one issue is uh, having a place to live whatever mm -hmm. that, and a, a place where you can feel safe and you can feel secure and you're um, you're able to have mental health um, and, and calm in your life and so I think that's a good place to start um, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is answering your question, but I think that there's a lot that a municipality can do. Mm. And I think that, to Neil's point, um, part of London's struggle has led to us being nimble and innovative in the way that we approach things. We're not getting, we haven't historically got the same sort of dollars from senior levels of government uh, as places like Ottawa, for example, or Toronto. Uh, when I look at the growth plan, the, the Ontario Growth Plan, we're not on it. That means we're not in an area that is planned to grow at that provincial lens, and then I hear about all the money that goes into those growth goals. Fair enough, but the point is that we've been, I think, pretty inventive. So Housing Development Corporation, the way that we've administered affordable housing dollars, now we're looking at a whole new range of other um, tools that might be able to come together in a more comprehensive strategy to increase the amount of affordable housing uh, development that's occurring in our community. But there's lots of examples, lots of people that know this subject area better than I, but I do think that's one area that's a good area to start. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, so I'll maybe talk to two things. One is um, I know the great work that's been um, the conversations around precarious work, and, and I can use the example of the sector I come from. Um, the Ontario Nonprofit Network has a program or, or project, research project around decent work for the nonprofit sector and decent work for women. And there are huge gaps and inequities that happen, so I know it's happening broader than that, but just bringing that perspective that this is something we need to look at. Um, people look at the nonprofit sector as, you know, people who work there, they're caring so they can, you know, basically work for nothing. And so, like, how do we, how do we shift that, that conversation? And then um, going back to this cross-sector collaboration and how do we come up with new tools to solve um, things like poverty and housing, just linking it to that social finance. If you're, we're watching the federal government just announced 755 million for a social <laughs> finance fund um, and 50 million for getting um, the investment readiness. So you have a social enterprise. A social enterprise sounds like something that maybe like what does it mean? But really, you can start something that is getting at the root of the issues and building business models that create change and. Um, address inequities at the same time as creating a profit and when you blend that. So we looked at um, London, there's 40 billion investable assets around social finance. If we can unlock a little bit of that, we've been investing um, through Verge Breakthrough Fund in affordable housing, in community hubs, in social enterprises. Uh, and I think this is a place-based model that could go across the country um, as one example of how, you know, so those are kind of two things that come to mind when I'm thinking right. about yeah. about this. Yeah. But always rooting it in people. Um, right. And why are you starting a social enterprise? It's It has to, in people or environment, um, the planet and people. Yeah, and it speaks to what John was saying about you need to do the big stuff and you need to do the bottom up. And how do we access this federal time, money? Right? And it requires uh, the coordination, yeah. the example you gave, of all everybody coming together to access this big money that's available to cities. We just have to show a united front. Yeah. Um, final quick question before I open it up for a couple of questions is, uh, um, <coughs> if you think 20 years from now, um, well, what's one thing that you hope will have changed in London? Hmm. And what's one thing that you maybe hope will not have changed? Um, 
Mm. Ariel, do you want to start mm. with that? Mm. <laughs> Something that would have changed. Um, I hope that we get to a place where, um, as a community, we can kind of remove the, the divide between us and them, and we work collectively together regardless of class, um, regardless of what community you're from. I think that that's something that we still deal with a lot in London when we're trying to address poverty, trying to address um, housing, the stigmas around housing, the stigmas around um, uh, social issues that we have in our, in our, in our city. Um, and you know, I'll give you an example of something that I heard a lot when I was campaigning was, is it true that you know some of the people you know that are on the street right now are not from London, you know? Um, and it would kind of annoy me because I'm like, well, if they're not from London, does it really matter if they're not from London? If they're coming in from another city because there are Londoners who go to other cities, and we're all Canadians. Like, why do we have to always put a divide between us and them? I would, I would love to see that change. Um, yeah. I want to see people, um, you know, love their community enough to see everyone as just their community and not <coughs> the, the divide between us and them. So, yeah. Anybody else want to come in with <laughs> some words on this? Let's go first. John? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, we're in the water here. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, well, what I would love to see is a, a really vibrant downtown. Um, one that sends the image of the vibrancy of the community overall. One that uh, is, is for everyone. Yeah. So it's not exclusionary in any way, but at the same time really expresses that this is a vibrant city, this is a prosperous city, and it's, it has opportunities for everybody. Lots of third spaces for people to hang out in. Lots of ways to feel embraced by community. Lots of ways to feel like you actually are tied to and connected to your community uh -huh. gathering places and events and um, also this this feeling that uh, you wanna this is the city that you really want to live in but yeah. the downtown contributing to that there's much more mm -hmm. of course in terms of things that uh, I hope never changes um, it, our, our heritage so Sandra will be uh, mm -hmm. happy to hear this <laughs> one and Sandra's one of those champions I was talking about you talk about pounding she pounds on me in my office all the time. <laughs> well, about heritage issues. So uh, I think that heritage is an incredible part of that identity that we've been talking about. Whether we grow or not grow, it's so important that we keep those pieces that express who we are as a community and um, that we do a good job of, while we have to grow, we need to grow in ways that are sensitive to that kind of re recollection of who we are and where we've come from. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I think being an academic, I would really like to see uh, this community, this center actually, give meaning and imagination to the mid-sized city uh, as a kind of distinct model and strategy that would speak to the kinds of things Michelle and John and Ariel are, 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 are referencing here, and, and put it up against Richard Florida in a kind of spirit of dialogue <laughs> and, and, and uh, exchange. Uh, and use it then as well to be a policy model to guide investments in the city and how we build the city, but also to, 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 to reinforce a distinctive sense of identity about London mm -hmm. and, and what the mid-sized city means, its integrity and its shape and its dynamic. And I think that, that there's important intellectual work to be done to support the people that are on the front lines actually doing things um, mm -hmm. to build that. And we can do some of the, the intellectual work that supports your efforts on the ground. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I've changed my mind about eight times, but okay. <laughs> I think the one thing that I would say that we haven't really dug into is the racism and inequity that's happening in our community and, and going back to that, like what's the power that we're willing to let go of? So 20 years from now, if we um, can see a shift on that, I think, uh, you know, we do not want that as part of London's story and it's there in the background and sometimes really um, out there and I think it's upon all of us to, to recognize that and to know that we, we have those moments, all of us, and that how do you create a community where you can gently call each other, you know, um, and nudge each other when you're in that place because we're all doing that at different points because you can't have full understanding of all the inequities in our community and so like just having that own recognition and then what I would want to build on given what we're here today about 
is campus community collaboration. I think this is a huge opportunity and it's one of our assets um, as a community and we have good things happening like today and I think there's way more opportunity. So I'll do a little shout out, Evelyn who's uh, in the crowd there. We're in a mentorship relationship through the Women in Civic Leadership course through um, Kings um, and Brescia and I know you were connected to that as well. Um, and that like there's a million examples, Western like all of our, but I think there's just this if we can elevate that and put um, young people in as entrepreneurs, if you will, into the systems that we have, like the City of London, we're exploring <laughs> City Studio Vancouver and how do you bring that to London? I think that is how we're going to attract and retain young people, um, is through mm -hmm. campus community collaboration. Thank you, Pierre. Yeah. I'd like to follow in the direction that John was open. Uh, downtown's one of my areas of study, yeah. and I really like downtown, spend a lot of time in them. So if I came back 20 years from now, I'd like to have downtown with the light rail system running through it. I'm trying to redeem myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and also to put downtown in the image of London. I don't think downtowns will attract, most downtowns will attract the big chain stores. And the big chain stores have been a bit trouble anyways. But downtowns with kind of activities that are representative of London. I mean, small shops, cafes with different themes, uh, a lot of culture in the downtown, mix social classes as well, you know, stuff for different social classes, and all of that happening in the downtown, but most importantly, a lot of people. Thank you. Um, so, um, we'll take a couple of quick questions. We, uh, uh, our event officially ends in 10 minutes. Uh, um, so I'm gonna take about four or five minutes worth of questions and then we do have the room for another few minutes after that if people wanna have a little bit of a chance to visit. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, hi, uh, one of my questions, and it's been brought up a number of times at the end here, um, sort of the us and them, uh, and as well as the community Western collaboration. Um, it's my first semester at Western, I'm a master's student, and the thing that's really surprised me of London um, is kind of this animosity between the university body and the city. Um, so we see this a lot around, especially FOCO. Um, but not only that, but I also felt it a lot around the election. Um, so I went to a, I tried to get into a mayoral debate, but it was full, um, and I was actually told by one of the, by people from the city, um, that students, votes don't matter because we don't pay taxes, we're only here for a little bit of time, so that sort of thing. So I guess my question is, how do you see this relationship between the city and the school working effectively? Where do you think that it could build? And yeah, just sort of if a couple, I don't know, if you want to address that at all. Before we respond to that, I just want to let you know that it's not true. Students <laughs> pay lots of taxes and it would be a shame if we lost um, that money that goes into back into our city. So I don't know if anyone wants to. Well, you want? Go. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can go first. Uh, I think that you know it, it's a shame that there's been so much uh, negative attached to rapid transit because that is an opportunity to actually integrate students into the broader community. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, depending on the student, there's. Uh, but there can be a limited sort of capacity to uh, get around the city because of the way that transportation works. And I always feel bad when I see people, you know, huddled around a, a transit stop and then the bus going right by yeah. because it's full. Uh, so you I'm, don't I'm not stop and pick me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going by on another bus. <laughs> so my point is though that it is a great tool to integrate um, students into the community to de-ghettoize for the benefit of students as, as well as surrounding communities student housing and so wouldn't it be great to be able to live in the old East Village and be able to get to campus in 12 minutes and not worry about uh, 15 minutes whatever it is but reliable direct uh, and not stuck in traffic it's just one example. Um, we have worked fairly closely, or very closely, with Western on some of the near campus neighborhood stuff, and it's been the administration, but also the student body, and they've been phenomenal. Um, I haven't been involved for the last little while, but there's been some really good progress that way. Um, I spoke at a, a session about five years ago, and I remember the the students talking about feeling like they're in a bit of a bubble, 
And boy, it would be nice if we could find ways to integrate students into uh, the community more fully. So last thing I'll say is um, Michelle's working on some really cool stuff and we're working alongside her on... lots of people uh, in this room. <laughs> oh, is that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> on this whole notion of trying to integrate uh, students into an immersive learning environment within its, and working on solving city issues too. Yeah, well, so I mentioned City Studio of London, so just as an example, it's, you know, a, a program where the students go through, um, are partnered up in, into the community, um, and so, and then they partner up with the city and the municipality, and they get to work on projects right through, like, everything around city building, urban planning, cultural planning, get out the vote for youth, and so I think, like, when you can get people into community, I appreciate you putting it in the honesty in the room, though, because I think that that's part of how we get there is recognizing what's really like th that that is a narrative that has an undertone and if we just pretend like it's not happening I sometimes wonder if like if you look at a hundred percent of the story is that maybe a part of it and and it just gets the play because it's been a part of the story for for a while and so I think it's true and then I think there's so many other um, opportunities um, that exist in that moment so how do we kind of push and the last thing I'll say is how do we have forgiveness when we do screw up yeah. because sometimes we do mess up relationships between institutions and then how do we move past that and recognize if people are going to come on the bus later let's forget about the past and not hold on to it and kind of go forward yeah and you yeah, oh, I said bus too. Did you catch that? Yeah. <laughs> Personally, as someone who who had a full advantage of students on my campaign, um, I'm really saddened to hear that um, Kate Graham, who's sitting at the back there, had a, a course where it was like a campaign course, mm -hmm. and students who are not from London were able to engage into the election. And um, and I'm telling you, they got a lot of votes for me because they were students, and I. They were out in the community speaking to other students and um, it was really great to see how engaged they got and they were super awesome. I had really great students and I, I'm, I'm really sad that's, that's the narrative that you got to experience but I, again, I'm in my own bubble with students so <laughs> maybe because I was a student. That's how I actually got connected to, to you know City Hall. It was through a mentorship program from Western to the City of London and it was great. So. Yeah. Okay, yeah. just really quick, I think three points sort of from the university out to the community perspective. One is we under underestimate at Western the convening power of the university as sort of a neutral third space on issues like the opioids or transit or, or affordable housing, uh, that we can, we can have that convening role. Secondly, work integrated learning and bridging partnerships for our, for our undergraduates and our graduates into the local economy. Um, and then thirdly, uh, more on research partnerships, you know, local research par partnerships. I mentioned the medical innovation one, which is a really, fa you know, a strong example. But I mean, on social enterprise, there's a lot of stuff that could be done through, you know, the, the, the Ivy School and so forth. Some may be happening, but we could do more of that, I think, across disciplines to try to embed those partnerships to, you know, reinvent the, the inclusive and innovative London economy, right? So mm -hmm. convening, yeah. integra work integrated learning, and research <coughs> partnerships, yeah. I saw a hand back there, so I'm going to take one more question, uh, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Yeah. yeah, so just going along back to the discussion on economic climate and the general negative feedback of the city, I was wondering if the reluctance to kind of adopt that model is not so much uh, London's reluctance to change, but rather adopt models from other cities. Um, that fear that doing that would kind of make London forget its own characteristic struggles, because I remember when I was kind of doing research on car problems and during collections, uh, people were mostly against rapid transit because they were like, what, why adopt the new system we can still have struggles, there's still areas that are underserved. So I was wondering, not just rapid <coughs> transit, but other models that we can see in other cities, um, the fear of change, does it come from unaddressed needs? You guys have to go first this time. Okay. Um, okay, well, I'll, let me try this one. Um, I think, I, I like where you're taking this, and I think where we need to go next is to understand that, you know, there might be um, some underserved areas that, like, how do we take the plan as it exists today with some tweaks? Uh, and so we're hearing, you know, we have the, this beginning place, and this plan was really, like, it has to be iterative. So how do we take some of what we're hearing of some of the other you know, parts of London where people are feeling like, I'm not represented in, the, in this, and then move that forward. So I think that's the new story, is like how do we 
how do we not just say the whole thing's not going to work, but adapt it at this point um, and find that common ground? Yeah, and I think that my comments are very similar. And the sometimes we put ourselves into false choices that we don't have to. So, are we going to do potholes, or are we going to do a flex street? Um, are we going to do um, we're going to deal with poverty, or are we going to be talking about the back to the river project? And it doesn't have to be necessarily one or, one or the other. There's ways that we can stage things. There's ways that we can budget things. There's, well, I think we need to be balanced. So, for example, uh, when we look at the rapid transit plan, there is, and nobody knows it better than somebody sitting right behind mm -hmm. you, yes. uh, <laughs> Councillor Helmer there. But, uh, <laughs> but there's all kinds of improvements that are intended to be made with that investment. And, and remember, again, we're getting uh, a third of it paid by the federal government, or we yeah. potentially would, a uh, third by the province, a third by development charges, which means very little paid for, well, I guess that's 100% of it. Uh, <laughs> it's not quite there, but most of it's paid by those sources as opposed to taxes, and it's a great way to improve our local transit system in the meantime. So it was this great window, this opportunity. We'll see where we are right now, but um, and where we're going to go with it. But I'm with Michelle. I'm hopeful that we there's some sort of tweaks that can um, get us back on track, and um, hopefully we can do those things that you're talking about, improving our existing system. I'm not sure it's either or. Yeah, and I think that the idea of having um, the bus rapid transit, it's its honestly to respond to a lot of the needs that the community has. Um, it's to respond to those who are underserved. Um, so I, I, maybe it's the way we have those conversations. Um, I, I know a lot of people had a very negative, you know, BRT conversation. I like to say that I didn't as much. Um, people who who were against it just didn't speak to me. And <laughs> the, <ones who, laughs> the ones who were for it, we had really great conversation. People were just not informed enough. And some of the questions I would get, I was like, well, that's, that's the wrong information, actually, because we're not hiking up your taxes. We're, we're using our money that we've already invested, and it's going to serve your community. And so well, I'm, I'm, I take the bus, and is it going to come my, my way? Right? It's like, how do we get everyone's conversation involved without having to make this bus, I, I think maybe the bus rapid transit sounded too fancy, but it's really not. It's it's to serve the communities, to make sure that people who need the bus every day are actually getting those services, right? And there are a lot of people who can't afford cars, who can't afford other means of transportation, and they're relying on the bus, and we got to make it better so that our community as a whole collectively is served. So it's the way we have those conversations that I think needs to shift. It doesn't always have to be negative. And it's funny, you. We, when, you took a, when you look at rapid transit, another thing it does is it provides affordability or can. Yes. So it's one thing to build affordable housing out somewhere where somebody needs to now uh, get in a car. <laughs> and it's about affordable living. How do you set a context so that the affordable housing also offers uh, an affordable uh, way of mobility, essentially, yeah. that goes along with it? You know, quick final well, okay, just really quick. I mean, I'm generally a fan of incremental approaches to innovation, but I think on, on this one on transit, it's easy for me to sit <coughs> sitting on the sidelines. LRT might have been the way to go, and I think that reaching higher builds the kind of coalition that, that Pierre talked about there and can, you know, move the debate forward and mobilize broader support, aspirational support for a project in a way that the BRT wasn't. But it is easier for yeah. me to say that sitting here on the <laughs> sidelines and not having the responsibility to carry the larger project. But I do think that might have been one where a big innovation might have, might have built a coalition. Well, I hope that uh, we as academics are not going to be sitting too much on the sidelines, and that's part of yeah. what we're trying to do in this conversation here. So we could, we could keep taking questions all day, but we will not. Um, so um, thank you very much to everybody, and I'm going to turn things over for a formal thank you and wrap up to, uh, to Godwin Archer. Okay, yeah. so my name is Godwin, as Martin said. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I know it's been a very busy day, uh, bad weather out there, uh, but you've taken time to join us today, so thank you so much. But most importantly, I would like to thank the uh, panelists for coming here. You travel all the way from Guadalu to join us. Thank you so much for taking your time. John, I know you are a very busy person, but you still join us today. Mm -hmm. Michelle, as equally a busy person, so thank you. Ariana, I know you just been elected. a lot on your plate. Thank you for <laughs> joining us. And uh, Neil, you are one of your own. Thank you for being part of this center for all this time, and we hope that you continue to be part of it. So we have the next 15 minutes to be in this room. 
So please feel free to stay around, socialize. Uh, but from here, there is reception on the sixth floor, right? Mm -hmm. At the next center. So uh, you are welcome to join us to see the new facility where the center is located. Uh, we'll be here if you need any direction. We'll be here to escort you to the sixth floor. Otherwise, once again, thank you all for coming, and I hope that the conversation will continue even beyond this room. Thank you very much.